me, a veteran looks like my grandfather. Anyone could be a veteran. You can, from a young kid, a young 18-year-old to an old person. A veteran looks like an average, everyday person. What I think a veteran would look like is, it would vary. When I think about a veteran, I think of a guy in a wheelchair missing a leg. I think of a veteran, I think of someone who's older, like over 50 years old. A veteran to me initially looks like someone who comes back from war uh, with several injuries, maybe a broken arm, a broken leg, maybe an amputated leg or an amputated arm. A veteran looks like me, with a nose ring, tats, sometimes blue hair, <laughs> you know? A veteran is, looks like anybody else. You just, you never know. To me, a veteran looks like someone with just a lot of experience, a lot of medals of honor on their fatigues, and someone that's been back and forth to war numerous of times. A veteran looks like me. They look like Professor Banks. There's white, there's black, there's pink, there's green, there's orange, every color, every race. Um, fat, skinny, in shape, out of shape. There's, there's no one look for a vet. When I think about a veteran, I used to think of someone who's, you know, in a wheelchair, missing a leg or an arm. Someone who's usually older. A veteran looks like me. Uh, looks like my husband, looks like my son, my father, my brothers, my brother-in-laws. Uh, their fathers, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their aunts, their uncles, their children. And they come from all walks of life. A veteran looks like an average, everyday person, somebody, anybody off of the street. A veteran looks like uh, you and me. Look to your left, look to your right. Look in front, look behind you. You probably can't even tell because we look just like everybody else. I think a veteran looks like all of us. You know, um, I, you know I, it's amazing, especially more so nowadays, how, how varying the veterans are in terms of who they look like. They are, you know, they are people who are, who are um, short, tall, Brown, brown, you know, all different colors, you know. My name is Gustavo Ramirez, E4 Specialist. I served three years active duty in the United States Army. I was in Virginia. I am Ina, uh, former U.S. Navy, WAVE. Uh, we were called WAVES at the time. It was Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. And I am Vietnam era and I was a seaman. My name is Dave Moriarty. I'm an associate professor in the English department here at the Grand Campus. Uh, I got my master's degree in 68 and I uh, was working on my PhD and uh, was drafted. So that's how I got into the U.S. Army. My name is Patricia Edward and I used to be in the 82nd Airborne Division uh, with the Army. I was deployed over to Baghdad, Iraq. I was in Camp Falcon for eight months. My name is uh, Oscar Salgado. I actually signed up with the United States Army. I enlisted in early 2006 and I enlisted as an artilleryman, which to me it was one of those instances, okay, I don't know what that is, but hey, the video looks great. Let's give it a shot. My name is James Banks. I'm the, um, here at Suffolk, I'm the college-wide coordinator of multicultural affairs. I am a United States Marine Corps veteran. Um, I served in the United States Marine Corps from 1968 through 74. Um, I am a Vietnam veteran. I served tw uh, 22 months and 44 days in Vietnam. My first name is John. I go by Patrick. I was attached to Bravo Company 126 Infantry. I was an armor crewman. Um, I made my way up to corporal. Uh, my name is Angelique. My branch of service, I'm in the Navy. I've been in the Navy from uh, 90, December 97 to present. My most stressful moment was just basically just missing your family. As a single soldier, I didn't really have, you know, a wife and kids, so I basically just was on my own. I never got, like I said, a chance to deploy, so I don't know that kind of stress. But as far as being in the military, the more positive you are, the more positive input you put, you put in, the more positive, you know, you'll get back. 
Although I was stationed stateside in Charleston, South Carolina, there were times when we were subjected to stressful situations. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, we were on call 24 hours a day. And just living in the hospital complex itself, dealing with uh, body bags coming in every day and caskets going out, um, there were wounded soldiers that we had chow with every day. Um, I dated a young man who had no face and it was um, not something that was, we really didn't consider it stressful. It was part of our job, it was part of what we did. And we just coped from day to day. I have been exposed to uh, a lot of stress within the military community and within the military world. Uh, and just like uh, any soldier does at one point in time. Me trying to readapt to all that craziness, all that, all that anger, all that excitement, all that adrenaline, and coming back home to where I guess it's more calm it's, it's, it was very stressful. It was just something I wasn't used to anymore. I was part of the 82nd Airborne Division, which had for every one female, it was like 15 males. Being in the combat zone, being in the 82nd, also being around the infantry, the artillery, the tankers, and all those people, it just, it, it had me involved in more things that I didn't expect I would be, you know, being that I'm supplied, I'm supposed to be in the warehouse. No, we're on trucks, we're on convoys, we're picking up soldiers, we're picking up supplies, we're taking care of, you know, everyone, basically. And so anything that is not there, we had to make sure that we had to get. And so it was just very active day. I mean, it starts off from four in the morning sometimes, depending on when the trucks come in, till whenever the work is done. We do not leave until the work is done. So it could be one o'clock the next day. And so, but yeah, it was very, very hard. I was exposed to stressful experiences um, from the moment I arrived in Vietnam um, because as we were disembarking from the plane, they, they were receiving incoming rounds at the moment I got there. And everybody started running in all different directions and I didn't know where to, where to go or where to, where to run. I just followed the crowd. Fortunately, I followed the right crowd, all right, because they were headed towards a bunker, which really worked out well and I was totally okay. Um, um, and that was my, my, my orientation to Vietnam. And so at first, um, I spent a lot of time believing I was not going to return for many, many months. And, um, you know, um, that transitioned about halfway through my first tour when um, the, the commanding officer said, I really, really need a um, driver. And so I became the commanding officer's driver for the last half of my first tour in Vietnam. Um, and he was an expert Vietnamese linguist. So we would be going into the villages all the time and stuff like that. And part of the stress that I, I, I was exposed to with that was that, you know, I got to really see what poverty was really like. I thought I was impoverished as a child. I got to see what poverty was really like. Um, I got to see how people behaved when they were impoverished. You know, um, you couldn't stop and not watch your vehicle because they would take parts off of it while you weren't looking. Um, you know, um, people were starving. It was really, really a very painful experience that I, I, I'll never forget. And so I understand poverty. From the day I started till the day I got out, I found it stressful because it's not a natural lifestyle. I mean, when you have to constantly dress the same way every day and salute people whom you don't have much respect for, in the most part, for the most part. Uh, when you have to uh, stand in line for your meals three times a day, uh, it's pretty stressful. Just, just the day-to-day -day military lifestyle. Unless you somehow are psychically adapted to that kind of stuff. You, you find that comforting. It's stressful too to fall asleep every night listening to outgoing uh, artillery fire. The other thing that puts a lot of stress on you is that you're you're not fighting for your country you're not fighting for the people back home you're not fighting for freedom you're not fighting to save the south vietnamese uh, from communism you're fighting so that you can go home and the people you're with get to go home i would say the most stressful part of being in the military was definitely the year that i was in iraq you just you see things that 
you don't want to see, or you're, you're not that you don't want to see it. You, you're not. They don't. You're not prepared to see the things that happen in war. Like you don't grow up, you know, watching bodies getting blown up or, or whatever. And, that, and you see that stuff over there. You see bombs dropped, and then you have to clean up the mess from the bomb. You're pulling arms out of rubble, and it's it's horrific. I mean, I wouldn't wish that stuff on my worst enemy ever. Um, you know, friends get killed or get injured or whatever the case may be. And that's, I still think about some of the guys I was with over there that they didn't get to come back with us, you know? I mean, their body did, but they're not here anymore. So, that, that is definitely the most <laughs> stressful part. Yeah, I have been exposed to stressful experiences, and I think those that uh, those of us that say that we haven't are hiding something. And prior to going to the Middle East, I met uh, a girl through a friend of mine, and uh, we hung out, and you know, I got to know her just a little bit. And then um, I was two months from, actually three months from coming back here to the States. It was in August, and uh, a friend of mine had asked me. If I needed a care package sent to me, what do I need? I was like, are you kidding me? Like, send me the world. Like, send me magazines, Twizzlers, like, you know, anything that seemed trivial to someone else. Like, I just even a rock from my front yard, like, I wanted it, you know? So she said, okay. My friend sent me the package, and in the package was um, a little stone that had the word faith on it. And out of the whole package, as much as I was excited about those Twizzlers, like, I was more excited to see that because that meant the world to me, like that someone actually sent me a rock or a stone that said faith on it because I started to lose faith as when are we going home, like what's going on, you know, and the next day I called a friend of mine, another friend of mine here in the States, and she sounded upset and I said, well, I said, what's wrong, why are you so upset, and she says, um, she said, I don't know if I should tell you. I don't know if it's appropriate. You know, maybe I'll wait till you get home. And I said, no, tell me now. And she said, uh, Hinkley was killed yesterday. And like, I was dumbfounded. And the thing that choked me up the most is because her name was Faith. So I got that rock. Actually, my package was delivered the day before she died. So, you know, I held on to that, you know, I still have it. And, um, you know, I didn't know her very well, but I came in contact with her. And I knew that she was like the type of person, she was such a good person, and she's 23 years of age. And she made everybody laugh, and she was like the most positive person ever. And it angered me, and I actually became obsessed with her death. Um, I didn't sleep. Uh, for months, um, it took me eight months to almost a year to be able to sleep. Um, if I slept three hours in a day, a whole 24-hour period, that was a lot. Um, how I even survived on that much sleep, I have no idea. I would get third, fourth winds, you know, and just move on with my day. Um, I would go on YouTube because I couldn't be, nobody, I was still in theater, I couldn't go to the funeral or anything, and so I'd go on YouTube and there would be this news reporter from Fox News, and he was um, laying on the ground and speaking to the camera about how a, a, a rocket had just hit and a soldier died 400 feet away from him, and as he's reporting, and all I could think about was that with Hinckley, the 400 feet away. You know, and you go through things like that, and you don't necessarily have to like be somebody's best friend. You know, just the contact. I mean, we're all each other's brothers and sisters, and it just it takes you to a different place uh, in your life, like somewhere really dark. And if you're lucky to find your way out, and you have a good family and a support system, then you're lucky. Um, I had a great family and support system, but I chose to push them away because I felt like they didn't understand um, that they were invading my privacy um, and that uh, nothing they could say would make me sleep 
would make me better. And recently, I, the past four months, I've actually been able to sleep. Uh, my way of sleeping when I came home was taking Benadryl, down, drowning myself in alcohol, so I didn't have to think, or I could just be knocked out. And, but then Benadryl wasn't working. So then I had to do something, so I went to the VA and I asked, said, look, I need help. Don't ask a veteran what they did when they served over there. Don't ask uh, uh, questions, but if um, those people are willing to share with your uh, students uh, their experiences, that's wonderful. So when you come back and students are like, oh, well, you know, you was in the military, did you shoot anybody? It's like, you know, if I did, <laughs> you know, like, it, that's not a memory, something I would want to remember. It's not something that you would be proud of. It's like, okay, it was a job that I had to do. It was a situation, and, you know, this is what happened. It's not like, oh, okay, you know, I came out on a rampage, like Rambo, you know. And so it, it, it's, it's like students need to be self-conscious with veterans' emotions. When I talk to veterans, it never ceases to amaze me how insensitive other students are often to what some of the veterans have gone through. And I, I really think it's very significant that that should be talked about to students when we know and if we know that we have veterans on campus. Because the bottom line is, is that to ask some of the questions that they ask, you know, the typical one like, how many people have you killed, those kinds of things, that really doesn't touch people in the right way after having gone through those experiences. And some of the memories associated with some of the injuries and some of the concerns and, and situations that we vets have gone through uh, are not happy ones. You know, and so, um, you know, while it looks so, so um, exciting and dramatic to someone who's not gone through it, once you've gone through it, it changes your whole perspective on things, you know changes the way you look at things, you know. And one of the things that I have on my email is if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I mean that very specifically, that people really need to adjust some of their thinking. The other thing that I really do um, say very strongly to other students is that while a student may look like he has, a student veteran may look like he or she has a, an attitude or, or is not um, as open as you would like, uh, or they may even look like, some people might have even termed them as being somewhat angry or nasty. Uh, sometimes it could be a direct result of them having some emotional difficulties such as PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. And it just looks like they're just being a mean person or they're just being a non-receptive person. So the first reaction is you know, to treat them like you would anybody that's perhaps uncomfortably handling you or reacting to you. But that's not a good idea, especially nowadays where we have so many of them coming back after having some horrific experiences. We need to become sensitive as a society. My fellow students should know that I am just like them. I listen probably the same music as them. Um, I enjoy life just as much as they do. Um, I just have a different job. Students should know that there are veterans on campus and that they need to be a little sensitive to the fact that most veterans have, especially nowadays with two wars, well one's over now, but the veterans are coming back, most of them have been to Iraq. They need to be sensitive that they're around and that you, know, you can't ask them questions like, oh, how was it over there? That's, what, how, how am I supposed to answer that question to somebody who has no idea about being, being in, in a war zone. You know, I can talk to my fellow veteran about it. You could just say, hey, you're in Iraq, huh? How was that? What'd you think? What'd you learn there? That would be a great question. A good question to ask a veteran is, are you okay? A lot of times we get forgotten or people are afraid to invite us out because they don't know how to relate to us. Or sometimes we don't know how to relate to them, but the, the best thing to do is just to ask us if we want to be a part of a certain activity or something. You'd be surprised. We probably, nine times out of 10, we do. Now, if you recognize or you find out that we are service members or we are veterans, and you just want to say, hey, you know what, thanks for what you did or anything like that, then that alone, that actually does feel good. 
The best thing that an administrator, faculty member, a student, or any civilian anywhere can say to someone who's been in the military, thank you for your service. Very often, veterans will um, uh, think of themselves as, as humbly as any other person, you know, and not necessarily be out there bragging about what they've gone through or talking about what they've gone through. And that's often because they don't even want to visit the memories or the thoughts about it. You know, uh, some, some will tell you that they've wake, woke, uh, awakened in the middle of the night you know, thinking about what they've seen, you know, I for one did that, okay, um, for a few months after I returned. There are things that remind you of those experiences, loud noises, all kinds of things that could in fact impact, um, you know, uh, how a veteran reacts. And it's not because of you. We should not be blaming, uh, we should not be blaming you, nor should we blame the victim for, for what, what their responses are to, to uh, to anything. We just need to be there and try to support them through it. And I think that's an effort that, that every one of us can put into um, helping the experience be a better one for veterans when they return. Um, the main thing I would like the staff and the faculty to know about veterans is that we, we, we get to experience something that rarely most occupations could, could get to experience. So I would say when a, when a, when a, when a veteran was to talk you know, to have more of a, a open ears instead of a judgment to pass. Um, not because we deserve it or, or want it, but more of the fact that it can open up people's minds and people's ideas of how they see things. What I think the college staff and the college administrators should know about veterans is if you don't have somebody that can actually walk you through like step by step, we may lose someone. One of the things they should know about veterans is each one is different from the other. Um, uh, but that they come from this common experience um, and some have uh, uh, been damaged more than others. Um, I think um, there should be a certain respect uh, and understanding granted veterans. And I, when I have veterans in my uh, classroom, um, they're usually much more intense, much more into the academics than the ordinary or the usual student. Uh, I, I think the, the college staff and administrators here at the Eastern Campus are great with how they handle veterans and I think maybe a, I guess you would call it sensitivity training, just a, an hour of don't say this, don't say that. If somebody gets up and has to leave, don't worry about it, you know. They're probably just having a rough day, especially the new guys. It's important that administrators, faculty, and students remember that veterans have walked a different path. Unless you've walked a mile in their shoes, you can't really understand what a veteran has been through, what their training has done to, that, to them. It's changed them forever. Those who have been in combat situations will never look at life the same way again. And it's important to be very, very compassionate. College administrators, faculty, and staff should know that although veterans um, look like everybody else, I'm not everyone else, um, a lot of people think that we shouldn't get special treatment, but uh, those same people don't want to do my job. So I think that um, once identified as a veteran, I think that the staff should have a separate orientation for the veterans. I think that we have student orientation, but student orientation is very general. I think the colleges should have an orientation for the veterans because a lot of veterans don't know the entitlements, what they're entitled to from the schools. Um, you know, it's, it's like a guessing game. They're like, oh, well, you know, do you think they offer this or that? And we don't know. And then we later find out, you know, as we're graduating, <laughs> that these resources were available to us. So I think having an orientation where everything's laid out on the table, all questions are asked, and that they become a great support system for us would be something that would, would benefit any veteran coming into their school system. I would say, it's, you know, as a faculty member, is if you have um, 
uh, veteran, they may need a little bit more time to adjust to the academic life, to, to readjust to coming back and finding themselves in this kind of environment. So I guess patience would be uh, patience and um, cutting, as a military term, cutting them some slack. Uh, they deserve it. Just welcome us, just be like, hey, you know, um, try and be understanding for those. We don't, you know, we don't want special treatment per se. It's nice to, for, if we have to deploy or something, it's, or go somewhere like I just had, came back from an op. Most of my professors are understanding and allowed me to do the work in my own time. And I think that for uh, students that are transitioning into college, um, that are veterans, most of our concerns come from if I have to deploy, will my professors work for me, what, what work with me, or what or will I have to quit school? Because a lot of us don't want to stop, you know. So it's great to have a support system for the, pro the professors, you know. Uh, if they're willing to open up in a classroom and talk about their military experience, fine. If not, don't push it, leave it alone. Perhaps in time, they can talk about it. I mean, I, I had a, a kid tell me, because, you know, he confides in me a little bit. I'm, you know, the head of the vets here, I guess you could say. And he told me that one of his professors asked him in front of the class if he had killed anybody. And I, that's not okay in any fast, I mean, even if it wasn't a veteran question. And he, the professor probably just didn't know any better. If they want to be known as a veteran and talk about something relative to the, what they're talking about in the class that, you know, they've gone through in the military, then let them say it. Don't say, hey, Pat, I know you were in the Army. What do you think about this? So that's definitely a big no-no. I mean, I wouldn't care, but a lot of people would. Definitely the killing to anyone, that's... I think that would be common sense almost, but be sensitive that, that they're around and don't out them amongst their peers. The PTSD and depression issues that are coming up is, is pretty, I think, startling how many people have that. And the, even the, um, the suicide rate of veterans is, I mean, it's, I think it's one every hour and 20 minutes or something like that, something ridiculously high. I think college administrators, faculty, and staff should really get to understand that student veterans, while they may look similar to the typical students because they come from all walks of life and they're in all sizes and colors and, and nationalities, et cetera, uh, have some special issues that they might be confronting with respect to their own emotionality, with respect to their lack of um, uh, contact with others because they've been gone for a long time, so they have to re-indoctrinate themselves and, and integrate themselves into society. And so there's some changes in terms of how they must be approached. And I would really I would recommend to faculty and, and administrators and staff to try to get to know um, that approaching them may be a little different than it is for others. I believe setting up a support group, even if it's the personnel in the VA, even if it's the counselors up here in the school, even if it's friends, I mean, because even if it's the ser service members you even used to work with, even though it's a little different now that you're a civilian. <laughs> and so, but it's, it's more like you have to have it because it's like, once you lose that motivation, like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get up, you may fall into the brink area where it's like, you know what, I ain't got nothing else to live for. And so it's just, 
because that was one of the issues that I was battling with. It's like, what do I got left to live for? I'm not in the service. I'm not doing this. A lot of things is not coming my way. I don't know how this is working. I don't know what to go forward, how to go forward. The transition to college for students can be made much easier by them knowing what's available to them, uh, knowing there's always someone there that they can talk to. Uh, they're not alone. There are other veterans here and making sure that these veterans know about the Student Veterans Association. Um, something that could help what I thought about before that um, maybe before you get out the Army if, you're, if you know you're set to get out the military they can have a program where they'll, they'll start getting you enlisted in the, in the Army I mean, in, in a college you're going to, to the state, back to the back to the state you're going to, maybe a month or two prior to you leaving. So when you get back, your school enrollment will either be ready, ready to go, ready to go through, or have you know very little time waiting with the process of going to college. A recognition that we have do have veterans among us and not make them invisible. Uh, I think uh, organizations or clubs uh, for veterans, but also open to uh, non-veterans. But for those of us that are eligible for the post 9-11 GI Bill, it would make it a lot easier if they could like expedite things a little, a little faster for us to make our transition into college. Because one of the things, at least I know for myself, you know, I came in here, I used the post 9-11 GI Bill, a great thing, you know, a, a great program. Um, however, you know, there's so many of us that are, are using it and the time for the money and the funding to get to the school and we're worried about that. I would say to the average veteran, you better take advantage of the benefits you're getting now because this is not going to last forever. Guaranteed it's not going to last forever. One of the things that I see happening as we veterans or as veterans transition back to stateside is I see a real need for connectedness while at the same time staying separate. So you have to honor and explore what is needed by the individual. So we almost, you know, you can't generalize the whole population. You almost have to reach out to individuals and test that. And I see this with some of our student veterans even, that sometimes there needs to be, because of what we've gone through as veterans, we are not necessarily as sensitive as we need to be to other veterans when they might be experiencing some crises and, and, and mental disorders or difficulties, you know, um, in terms of reacclimation. So uh, there needs to be a constant reminder for everyone that this transition period is not easy. It's like, You've been away forever, and you're coming back, and the world looks different. People are different. People you grew up with are all gone. You know, um, people in, people um, that you come in contact with in your in the business world and stuff like that treat you differently. Expect different things from you. You know, there's all kinds of things that we need to really be aware of, and as a as a society, as far as helping veterans get there, um, get comfortable again as they make the transition back here. And we also need to recognize that some student veterans are still in the military, you know, at the reserve level, et cetera, especially in the no nowadays troops. I think there needs to be a one-stop shop hub for vets. I think there needs to be an orientation for veterans only. Now, so if you do have that point of contact, that, that experienced individual that at least has been around the military uh, world, that can understand or at least comprehend a little bit of what we're saying, how we feel, how our approach is, that is such a big factor. It's a big difference, it really is, because it makes everything so much easier. Veterans may be eligible for free health care, counseling, educational benefits, legal resources, employment opportunities, housing assistance, and many other resources. If you or someone you know is a veteran, find your local Veterans Affairs Healthcare Network VA Medical Center or Vet Center. If you or someone you know is in crisis or in danger of harming themselves, call 1-800-273-TALK. Press 1 for veterans. For more information on the Veterans Crisis Line, it can be found at www.veteranscrisisline.net. Volunteer opportunities can be found at www.volunteer.va.gov. Training for college and university staff can be found at www.mentalhealth.va.gov slash studentveteran.